Dorothy and I have certainly enjoyed our stay here this weekend at the Wood House, as Brother Elkins used to call it. But it's now the Wood Bed and Breakfast, Beauty Salon, Hair, Makeup, and whatever else you need. And we're so grateful to Pat. She's such a great hostess, and it's always wonderful to be with her. And to reminisce about Harold and those times that we had in the back years. But we're grateful to be here. This is the first time Dorothy and I have been able to go anywhere since last November. And so I know that uh, as we go along, it'll get better in traveling, but I'm just grateful she was able to go through this and come here with me this week. Thank you to the elders for the invitation to be with you. It's always good to see Glenn and uh, Danette. I've been trying to teach Danette how to spell Jeanette, but she keeps putting a D in front of it. And so, but it's always good to see them, see Daryl and Michael and all the, I told, uh, I think her first name is Hannah, is it Hannah? Am I right? I said, you must have read Horace Greeley's article from the 1800s because he said, go west, young man. And she did it and she's a young girl. So that's a wonderful thing. And I understand, Michael, there's gonna be another wedding here coming up in November. Well, then we'll look forward to that. And these West brothers will become miserable one by one as they get married here, right? Is marriage that bad? I have an interesting assignment this afternoon. They'll know we are Christians by our love. If you'll open your Bibles to the 13th chapter of John and listen to the Lord as he comes toward the end of the what we call the Last Supper, he says something very interesting. He said, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. Well, there was a commandment given in the Old Testament to do this, Leviticus 19, 18. But what, it is, what is new about this one? He adds it, he mitigates it, as I have loved you. What a challenge. And so I have to ask myself the question this afternoon, how hard is it me, for me to love my fellow Christians? It's interesting that he did not use the physical word eros here, never used in the New Testament for love. He didn't use the word phileo, which is a very intimate term. It has to do with brotherly love, the affection you have for your own physical brother or sister the affection you have for your mom or your dad, Storge, and your brothers and sisters. Didn't use that word. He said, I want you to agape one another. For sure, this was his commandment. As I have agape you, that you also agape one another. Why, Lord? By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. So I'm asking myself the question, not a test question, it's not a test answer. How hard is it for you, Keith, to love your fellow Christians? I have to dig deep now to find the answer to that. I have to dig way down in my heart because that's the only place the answer is. Would you start your, the study with me at Matthew 5, 22, please? How, how great do I love my brothers and sisters? What, how, to what lengths will I go to show that? Here's one. It's an interesting study about two brothers who have a problem. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever will say to his brother, you're worthless, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Why? You've gone too far in the relationship. There's no agape here. Therefore, now here's the only verse in the Bible that says don't come to worship. You're not allowed to come to worship under these conditions. God won't accept your worship. He said if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother hath ought against thee, leave your gift. Don't you come to worship under those conditions. How hard is it me for me to love my brothers and sisters? And go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. If, my, if Dorothy and I are on the outs, 
our prayer is not even heard by God. 1 Peter 3, 7. There is a relationship required when we come before God called agape. It's a relationship that's demanded between fellow Christians, but not it doesn't stop there. Look over Matthew 18 with me for a minute at verse 15. If you remember that your brother hath ought against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he will hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. If he will not hear thee, take with thee two or three witnesses. Now don't tell those people ahead of time what happened. Then they're not witnesses. They have to go and hear what the brother is saying without any prejudice from you. You just say, you've got to go with me and see this brother. Why? I can't tell you. Come and hear. Well, if, he, if they listen to him and they settle it with, in their presence, then it's over. You and your brother are back in a good relationship. If you neglect to hear them, and here's the part we skip, brothers and sisters. Here's the part that demands great love from the whole congregation for this brother who has the problem. He said, if you neglect to hear them, the witnesses, tell it to the church. We don't practice that correctly in my judgment. In fact, I know how we practiced it at Gregg Avenue. The whole congregation went to her house, kneeled down in the front yard, and were praying for her when I knocked on the door. And she looked out there and saw all those folks from the church who were told what was happening. They were told, the church was, praying for her. She repented. And when she did, we didn't have to let her be unto us a heathen and a publican. How much do I really love my brothers and sisters? This brother doesn't want to be a member of a congregation doesn't care about me. I want you to be so interested that the whole church will come, as Jesus instructed us to do. And notice verse 20. He said, when the church makes this kind of a decision, I'm right in the middle of it. Verse 20 is not about worship, two or three gathered. It's about two or three gathered to take care of this brother's problem. And he says, I'm right in the middle of it. Why? Because that shows the greatest love there is, to go and get this brother back. Look at Galatians 6, 1 and 2. Here's a brother who didn't intend to sin. He's overtaken in a fault. He says, ye which are spiritual, that is, you have some understanding of this kind of a problem, restore him. That's a medical term. It's the same term you'd use if you're resetting a broken bone. And you wouldn't go up to a person with a broken bone and shake his arm all around. You treat him gently, you give him something for pain, and so on. You try to restore that limb. This brother's broken off from the body of Christ. He needs, he needs restoration. How much do we love him? Look at verse 2. This is a burden we have to bear with each other. Bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. How do you do that? You would think there would be specific instructions in the Bible on how to go out and reach these folks who are lost, these lost brothers and sisters. There are. Look at James 5, 19 and 20. My brethren, if any of you do hurt from the truth and one convert him, that's the key, brothers and sisters and preachers. You got to study with them just like you would any sinner because that's what they are now. Let him know that he that has converted the sinner from the error of his ways has covered a multitude of sins and saved a soul from death. We go out and because we love them, we got to study with them. Let me ask us a question today. And you ask all your brothers and sisters in this area, you ever been at odds with each other? Have you ever thought, I can't forget what you did to me? Look at Matthew 5, 46. If you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And somebody will come back and say, Keith, but you don't know what they did to me. How am I supposed to love her or him? In a congregation northeast of us, way northeast of us, two couples come in every Sunday and they sit on either side of the pew. He used to be married to her and she used to be married to him. Besides the adulterous arrangement, they don't speak to each other. Yet they walk into the building 
as if they're going to worship. What did we just learn from Matthew 5, 22 and 23 and 24? They're not worshiping. They're showing up in the pew, but there's no love. There's a wrong kind of love between those two couples, but there's no Christian love between any of them. How do I practice agape? Because Jesus expects it. Let's go to Romans 5, 6 through 8. How do I do this agape thing, this service that's rendered because you need it? Uh, there must be some way I can get through this, some practical application, something told us. Here we're told something about our Lord that might help us here. I just got a text and I know what it is. Excuse me for that. Here Paul is mentioning something about God's love that's overwhelming. He says, when we were yet without strength, we had no ability to save ourselves. In due time, in the right time in history, Christ came and what did he do? He died for the ungodly. Is that what he says? For that's such a, an overwhelming thought for me, and it's really not my subject. But that teaches me that God loved me as much as he's ever going to love me before I ever became a Christian. He proved that at Calvary. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone even dare to die. But God commendeth his agape toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It is often very hard to see a practice in another human being, not like it, and still love that person. Let me see if I can illustrate why it is that we have to do that and where we learn it. A young lady wanted to get married and she prayed that the Lord would send her her knight in shining armor. And she thought she met him. Oh, she was so overwhelmed and excited. This is the one. He didn't even ride in on the white horse, but he was the one. And it was all excitement. And they got engaged. And they walked down the aisle, and they were married, and everything was so exciting for about two weeks. And then, Doug, she noticed that he left his dirty clothes lying all over the floor. And strange stuff in the sink from when he brushed his teeth. She didn't even know what that was. And he made funny noises when, noises when he ate. And when he slept, even funnier noises. So she got on her knees and she said, Father, I think you gave me the wrong one here. No. He gave her the right one because agape's job, and this is the hardest part of it, is to learn to love, watch it, the unlovable. And Glenn, that's why we're in a church. If we weren't in the church, I believe you and I would never know each other. But since we do, could you act better? No, I can't expect that. I accept you, whatever you are. What, what, what is you? And we try to help each other get more like him. We're in a group to learn to love the unlovable. That's what agape does. It's not easy. It's not easy. I mean, when Bradley Smith is watching me, he goes to sleep, snores while I'm preaching. I don't know if I can love that or not, Bradley. It is good to see you, though, always. What do you got here? Oh, some disease. <laughs> Agape, folks, loves the unlovable. Isn't that a marvelous thought? But look at where we live now. We live in a time of inflation, political ugliness, family breakdown, educational insanities, anarchy, you fill in the blank. Something's going on here all the time. But we need more than ever then our Christian family right now. We need it more than we've ever needed it. Because this is the only place I feel at home. When I go into the gas station, I don't feel at home. The grocery store, no. The mall, no. And I learned that to the nth degree since last November when she could not go to the assembly ever. And finally, last Sunday, she got to go to both services. But I watched her at home crying. What's wrong? I, I can't see my brothers and sisters. I love my family. Over and over again, I love them. I love them. She missed them. November to June, not once did she assemble, but she taught me something. 
When you miss that assembly, you miss life itself. You don't learn anywhere else how to practice agape. Look at Mark 12 with me for a minute, 28 through 31. They shall know we are Christians by our love. Mark is writing, of course, about the life of Christ. But here he says, one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them while asking, which is the first commandment of all? The first of all the commandments is the Shema. Shema means hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. A unified being in three persons, isn't that interesting? And with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, with all thy strength, this is the first commandment. The second is like it, namely this, thou shalt agape thy neighbor as thyself. There is some, none other commandment greater than these. What is this commandment? I saw four loves there. God, neighbor, self, and if I read the next verse, enemy. He puts the category of agape into four different beings to love, but they're all linked together. I love God, neighbor, self, enemy. What's that look like in practice? Agape of self should be labeled probably discernment, otherwise it becomes narcissistic. One of the miraculous gifts of the first century church was the gift of discernment. This would be the spiritual one who could go help that brother. But without discernment, self-love is dysfunctional. I have to know my limitations or I don't love myself correctly. And if I have no understanding of my limitations, it will be a kind of a copy of the crowds out, everything else, and I'll become so involved in self that as the psychologists say, I'm narcissistic. That's not healthy. But why is it that it has to be a healthy love of self? Because if I don't have that, my agape can't flow out to others. I have nothing to give others. But in the church, we learn something. We learn that God loves us. That makes us special. And because we learn that we are special and related to him that way, we can flow out to each other because we get a healthy discernment of self. I'm God's child. She's God's child. In fact, John was, was amazed by that. He said, what manner of love the Father spoke upon, bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. And therefore, the world doesn't know you because it didn't know him. Brethren, now are we the sons of God. Now watch this. He gets more excited. But it does not yet appear what we shall be. We are God's children. And that love can flow out to each other. And when it does, something else happens. Because in agape love, when my neighbor, not a Christian, is loved this way, what I'm practicing is fairness, justice, adherence to a moral ethic. If I borrow something from my neighbor, I give it back to him in better condition or in at least the best, same condition as he gave it to me. That is loving my neighbor as myself. Wouldn't I want that done for me? And so my agape toward my neighbor becomes a, an agape of justice, basic fairness, adherence to a moral ethic. I do right. That's a higher code than just being self-interested. Look over at Psalm 15 and 3 and 4 for a minute. This is the person that the psalmist says can live in God's holy hill. This is a person who never takes up a reproach against his neighbor. And if he promises his neighbor something, watch the end of that verse, he swears to his own hurt. If I give my neighbor my word, if I'm practicing agape, if I'm practicing justice, I'll do what I tell him I'm going to do. This is a mature love. It's a law of love, and a law implies a lawgiver. And that's why Jesus said, if you love me, <laughs> keep my commandments. It's not sentimental. It's action. And when I have this agape toward my neighbor, it flows from my self-love, but this also can extend to my enemies. And when I think about love of self, I think about the word discernment. 
when I think about the love of my neighbor, I think about justice and fairness, but when I talk about my enemy and loving him, I'm thinking about mercy. I have to qualify this so we can get a hold of what I'm saying here. Loving your enemy does not mean you like what he did. He's your enemy. God understands that. This guy has done something against you. Or maybe he's an enemy because of the mistakes you made. I don't know. Or maybe it's just his misdeeds. But when I love my neighbor or my enemy, I am willing to help him no matter what the situation is. That also is justice. Look at Romans 12, 19 and 20. Here's agape towards your enemy. Romans 12, 19 and 20. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him. Okay. If he thirsts, give him something to drink. Why? He's trying to overcome evil with good. Isn't that an interesting thought? Boy, that is so contrary to the way the world thinks. But in practicing agape toward my enemy, I've come to the pinnacle of mercy. I've learned what that is. It's not because they deserve our mercy. Oh no, they're our enemy. They don't deserve it, they did something. But this commitment to love my enemy is about me, not the enemy. It's not about them. It's about who we are as Christians. When he first loved us, we were still his enemies. That's agape. But that highest one was the first one, wasn't it? The most important one. They'll know we are Christians by our love of not only ourselves and our neighbors and our enemies, but God. There's no word here, one word I can give you to describe agape toward God. I could think of the word awe. It wouldn't quite reach the definition. I could think of the word power. Read Psalm 29 and listen to the, the psalmist describe the power of God. In fact, when you preach that, you really need a deep voice to express what's being said there. God spoke, and there it was. How do you do that? What kind of a being is that? I could think about the word awe, but then the word adoration came to my mind. That's responding to his love with my agape. We love him because he, first of us, 1 John 4, beginning verse 7. Adoration, I could think of that term, but I'm not sure that expresses everything about agape toward God. Awe, adoration. And then I thought about what Habakkuk said, that all the earth keeps silence before him. Earth, shut up and listen to God. Quit talking about yourself and listen to God. That's showing love for him. But this word is so much deeper, this idea of agape toward God is so deep that I can't get the right word for it. When we came into worship today, we sat in the very presence of his love, silently, adoringly, in awe, I hope. Because we are being taught the love that discerns between brothers and sisters. We're being taught the love that is merciful toward all humanity. We're talking about the love that can be merciful toward an enemy. But we're especially trying to describe the agape toward my brothers and sisters. I was sitting in an airport in Jakarta, Indonesia, all by myself, feeling down about being there all alone, wondering what in the world I was doing halfway across the world, around the world by myself, and who should walk in, Wade? Per Perry Cotham and Gus O both of whom have gone on to their reward in paradise. Gus Oaf was an interesting preacher. He wore some of the loudest colored jackets of any preacher I've ever known. 
we were over in Tokyo, Japan together one time, he and his wife and I, and, and they all announced it was time to go, and all the Japanese, of course, just rush up there. They won't, they're not very polite. They don't even get in line. But he started preaching to them. And I said, Brother Oak, if you're not careful, you're going to start World War III here. But, but here they came, and when they walked in, what happened? What happened to me? I'm halfway around the world, and here come two brothers in Christ. I was at home, Bradley. I was, I was, I was feeling good now. My brothers are here. Hmm. Brother Tom Holland had a TV program where he sat in a rocking chair on the back porch. Great, great lessons. Well, I, he agreed that he would come the last year I directed the lectures, or the last year he was living, that I was directing the lectures. And he would sit in a rocking chair up on the stage and preach to us that way. That was the agreement. He died before he could get there. We never got to do that. But the last time I was with Tom was at Pulaski, and uh, we have, they have a thing called a Servant's Day, and they had to carry him literally up to the pulpit so he could preach to us. Can you feel that pain for that brother, that love? When I say his name, it just, it's just so wonderful, Tom Holland. So many men like that and women over the years. We had a sister at South Haven who had such bad arthritis, she literally walked on her ankles. She'd come into class, Sister Eaton, on her ankles. She came in one day, and that class spontaneously stood up and applauded her. They were so inspired by her presence, this woman who could barely get from here to there. But she's my sister, and look what she's doing. My children have had a thousand grandparents over the years in places where we've worked, our family. That's what we're talking about. But I want you to imagine something as I close this. Imagine being in a place where nobody cares you're there. That's hell. But imagine a place that's so great that you can sit in the warmth of that love silently with great joy. That's heaven. I have been privileged, and I mean privileged, especially privileged, to know the love of a Christian woman for 60 years. My children, and I wore this tie today just because of that. See what it says? We love our dad. I know a child's love, especially if you've got money. I'm teasing you. I know that. Grandchildren's love and great-grandchildren's love. That's so special. We were at PTP one year, and one of my little great-grandsons came. And he saw me way down that long hallway. If you've ever been there, you know how long that hallway is. And he yelled out, Papa, money! But you know what I've never known? Never basked in it yet? Is pure love, pure agape. And I understand that I'm going to be so drawn to that light, that love, and bask in that warmth, and I won't ever want to leave it. Like a moth to a flame. But there's a problem here if I'm not a Christian. Darkness, gnashing of teeth, screaming. You will hear the most primordial screams you've ever heard in your life. If that happens to you, it will come from you. You will be in a place where there's no agape, no God, no one who cares about you.
what that one loves itself, its neighbor, its enemy, its God, and bask in the warmth of agape love. Do I offer the invitation? No. I'm done.